just before, perhaps just before taking any questions, um, a lot of this, the thinking that, that, that was cribbed from a lecture I'm about to give in Hong Kong, another place where values are important to remember, um, uh, in a few weeks' time. But a lot of these ideas um, were crystallised in my mind in the occasions that, as President of the Court of Appeal, I had the privilege to preside or sit on admission ceremonies, either with the Chief Justice, either with Chief Justice Spiegelman or Chief Justice Bathurst, or if, I, if they were away, I presided. Um, and they were they marvellous occasions. I, even if you don't have children or brothers or sisters uh, who uh, are lawyers and who've never been, you should actually go to one. No, no I'm serious. You should go to one. They're, they're quite inspiring occasions because they are uh, in each... There are about six ceremonies each Friday, and there's about four Fridays a year, where the young graduates who are admitted to practice come with um, well-dressed, smiling, proud, and they're the parents. <laughs> and, and the children and the parents are there and the families are there. And it's, and it's before they go out into the rough and tumble and the reality, the, t the tarnishing reality of life is practice. They, they get to listen to either the Chief Justice or the President of the Court of Appeal say some things. And it was these kinds of things that, um, that Chief Justice Spiegelman and Bathurst and I generally speak about. And it resonates with a truly multicultural group. It's an astonishing group of people. And that's why I think you should go, because it really shows you uh, modern Australia. Uh, in in its in its in its uh, diversity and its community, and these notions these notions of law as a, a trust and as a consensual relationship uh, is is fundamental because a society that has no trust or consent to its ex, its organs of power. Uh, is and will be a dictatorship. Are there some questions for... Here we go. Plenty. Thank you, uh, Chief, Chief Justice. That was, that was an incredible honour to, uh, to hear you speak about the foundations, I guess, of law and society. Um, my question relates to um, the more... Um, the hot topic of the day, which is about asylum seekers and um, refugees. And I really appreciate the context which you've, uh, which you've established for us. I wonder what bearing and influence international values and human rights values have on, um, you know, you talked about state power and, and state law and the, and, and the process of the law and sort of, you know, I guess, um, how, that, how, how actions are carried out towards individuals who are in that, not in the state, but perhaps temporarily in the state or arriving to the state. If you might address that, please. Well, all of our, all of the work that Justice Griffiths and Justice Perry and I do in relation to migration is all governed by statute. But as we, and in particular the three of us, have said time and time again, those statutes have to be read in the light of these values. Let me read you something that one of the best, one of the greatest judges who sat in the last 20 or 30 years in this country, the former Chief Justice, Chief Justice Gleeson said, when parliaments confer a statutory power to destroy, defeat or prejudice a person's rights, interests or legitimate expectations, parliament is in, taken to intend that the power is to be exercised fairly and in accordance with natural justice unless, unless it makes the contrary intention plain. This principle of interpretation is an acknowledgement by the courts of Parliament's assumed respect for justice. He said, 
the presumption is not merely a common sense guide to what a parliament in a liberal democracy is likely to have intended. It is a working hypothesis, the existence of which is known both to parliament and the courts and upon which statutory language will be interpreted. The hypothesis is an aspect of the rule of law. So he is linking those values to the very fabric of the rule of law. And in a sense, that's the answer to your question. We obey parliament, we read the statutes, but we read those statutes in the context that um, Chief Justice Gleeson has identified. Yes, <coughs> Professor Suzanne Rutland. Um, I'd like to ask you, or, or try to seek further, your issue of the balance between values and rules, and particularly the whole issue of values in stressing the rights of the individual. Because, um, and I come from a Jewish tradition, where the stress is not just on the rights of the individual, but also on the duties of the individual. Because there can be a conflict where you can't create a balance between the rights of an individual as against the needs of the community. And therefore, particularly for a court of law, how do you then approach this conflict where it's not an issue of a continuum or a balance, but where perhaps what an individual believes is his or her rights will conflict with the overall needs of the community. And I think your case of, of Cable, but that type of case can be a point where the law needs to struggle. So I just wonder if you could talk about issues of duties of the individual and the conflict between the individual and community needs. That cable gave rise to, <clears throat> or began, a series of cases that haven't ended. Uh, there's now about eight to ten of them, I think, where that conflict, and, and some go one way and some go the other. <laughs> Um, each state, for instance, now has on its statute books and administered and held to be constitutionally valid the capacity to, uh, for the courts to be authorised to judge statutes generally, not directed at any one person, uh, directed to the assessment of uh, sexual offenders who are nearing release and if and if those offenders have not engaged in sufficient, uh, have, haven't displayed characteristics in jail that can give some ground to uh, a view that they're no longer a danger to the public, they can be maintained in custody. Now, how one argues is that different from cable, and there are pages and pages of judgments of the High Court trying to resolve that very struggle between individual entitlement, uh, duty and protection of the community. And, that, and it's generally struck around uh, the, the text of the legislation and identifying what the limits of Parliament's power are. And the courts have struggled with it, but have struggled uh, in a way that's been broadly consistent. Johanna Sumas is singing from uh, PNG Consulate. I, I'm interested in your society and law. Just one, you might like to make comment on the uh, many societies here come from very different backgrounds, from Sharia law, private law, uh, civil law, and common law. In terms of family law, if you have an underage wife, if you like, and children, what happens in terms of divorce and uh, children? and into private law, into marriage and equity, how does the court look at that in terms of the totality of it rather than limiting it to the statute of one particular case, in a divorce case, maybe? Well, I'm not, uh, there's a number of questions in, in that. Um, uh, the age of consent for sexual activity is clear and there are in this country and there are no uh, cultural exceptions to it. Questions of, uh, questions of marriage 
uh, are governed by the Commonwealth statute, how exercises of discretion work within that um, uh, may, I suppose, be affected by uh, cultural context. I'm not a family lawyer um, and I'm not aware of the jurisprudence in that regard. But the point, if I may use your question to make a point, uh, and it's what I was meaning to develop when I was talking about those admission ceremonies. There used to be a body of thinking, and it's still quite strong in some areas of the law. It's a notion of positivism in, in legal thinking. That is, that's the rule, it's value, the law is value free, it's written in a code or it's written in a statute, you merely look at the words and that's the law. And if it leads to an unjust result, so be it, that's justice under law may be humanly unjust. And that's a, a 19, very much 19th century view and early 20th century view. The difficulty with that in a multicultural society is it leads to the rhetorical question, whose law is this? It's the law of the people in power. It must be someone else's law, it's not my law. And that's why in a multicultural society, the very development and recognition of the law needs to be rooted in human values that are common. Uh, and that's why the values that I identified are not numerous. Uh, it's not a charter of human rights. It's what lies at the foundation of the regulation of humans in society, in a, in a civilised society. And if you root your law in values that are common, you create the framework for a diverse group of people to have consent and trust in a power structure that has a, perhaps a, dis a historical disconformity with the creation of the present society. Um, I, did, I failed to do two things. First, I failed to acknowledge the Gadigal people uh, of the Eora Nation and their elders past and present, uh, the traditional custodians of its land, for which I apologise. And I also didn't read that marvellous paragraph of Roscoe Pound, and let me do so in the time I've got available. He was a great jurisprudence professor. He was, he, he reached his, his mental height of powers in the first 30 years of the 20th century. And he, along with judges such as uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Benjamin Cardozo and others, were fought against that kind of literal positivist notion that law was value free. And he said this at, um, at a university once. And he was talking about the constitutional guarantees in the American Constitution. And he said, the fundamental reasonable expectations involved in life in civilised society and a freedom from arbitrary and unreasonable exercise of the power and authority of those who are designated or chosen in a politically organised society to adjust relations and order conduct are so able to apply the force of that society to individuals. Liberty under law implies a systematic and orderly application of that force so that it is uniform, equal and predictable and proceeds from reason and upon understood grounds rather than from caprice or impulse or without full and fair hearing of all affected and understanding of the facts on which official action is taken. And embedded in all that is fairness uh, and equality. 
I haven't individually talked about mercy. I propose to in the talk that I, uh, that I uh, will give in Hong Kong. But it's the, it, I think, uh, is the, th the, the third uh, human um, force, along with a rejection of unfairness and a, and a sense of equality and dignity uh, that, um, that I think drives people and uh, drives societies. We have another question over here. Uh, Sarah Dickens from Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Uh, the last point you raised about um, whose values we're actually interpreting feeds quite well into the question that I'm about to ask. So Aust Australia is a very culturally diverse country and unfortunately our parliament and our judiciary don't accurately reflect the gender and cultural diversity that we display. So this is slowly getting better and you mentioned that admission ceremonies are having quite a diverse range of graduates being admitted and I myself recently got admitted this year. So my question is this, how can we speed up this process of increasing the gender and cultural diversity amongst our lawmakers and our law interpreters? I think anyone in this room is as well able to answer that question. Um, uh, it's a debate and a discussion that does not admit of a simple answer. Um, uh, the, I'm not going to get into a debate with you or with anyone about speed or uh, direction. Uh, I think there is significant progress being made um, and um, I, I, I don't have a simple answer but um, and I reject the proposition that a simple answer is available. Um, but the gender diversity of the courts has changed enormously over the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, the cultural diversity of the profession has changed. I don't think you can ignore the profession. The administration of justice is a partnership between the profession and the courts. Um, and uh, the cultural diversity of the existing cultural diversity of the court shouldn't be ignored. Uh, very often it is uh, because um, the large number of judges and practitioners who came uh, as first or second, uh, who are either first or second generation migrants, is generally ignored. Uh, um, and there is a degree of cultural diversity and there is a degree, an increasing degree of gender diversity uh, in the courts. But the other thing that you need to, un that I think one needs to understand uh, is that um, to a point, uh, courts and to a large degree, courts engender the consent and loyalty of a diverse society by what they do, not what the racial origin of the judge is, or gender of the judge is in a particular case. Um, and it's, I think, far more important to understand and concentrate upon the necessity for the development and vindication of the law and the common values that, and to recognise the common values that it encapsulates and is based on. And these are, as I said at the beginning, these are not necessarily the individual cultural specific um, traditions or uh, mores of different groups. They're the deep underlying 
matters of which I've spoken, which uh, I challenge anyone to say are not common.